So uh, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for taking the time to join us today. This is our first uh, uh, IPM uh, seminar of the year, and uh, uh, I'm delighted to uh, have Dr. Juliet Carroll uh, as our speaker today. So before I introduce our speaker, I want to go over uh, some Zoom logistics. Uh, we are going to be recording uh, this presentation. Uh, this uh, video will be posted in our YouTube channel. I'll put the link in the chat box uh, while uh, Julie is presenting. Uh, you can, uh, I'm gonna ask everyone to please uh, keep yourself muted. Uh, you can turn on the captions by clicking uh, the, the CC uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can ask any questions at any time and you can put it in the chat and I'll uh, read those questions uh, during our Q&A session after Julie uh, finished with the presentation. And I, I wanna invite everyone after the Q&A, we're gonna have a greet and meet for those who want to have a more uh, intimate uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Julie Carroll, uh, not only about her work on uh, hummingbirds and spotted wind or Sophie that but you can ask anything about fruit and fruit IPM she is the true expert uh, in the state. So uh, I just want to remind, this is our second year uh, doing this IPM uh, seminar series. And uh, the goal of this seminar is uh, to increase the awareness of new research uh, and techniques that advance IPM and its adoption in all types of pest management settings, agricultural settings, urban settings, uh, rural settings. So uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Julie Carroll, who is going to talk about uh, one of, one of her, I'm sorry, that is going to talk about one of her more recent research projects, looking at hummingbird predation as an IPM tactic against the spotted wind drosophila in raspberry. This is a subject that uh, which we will all be deeply interested uh, to learn more because it involves a problematic invasive pest and a very unique and fascinating animal like the ruby throated hummingbird. Dr. Julie Carroll is the fruit IPM coordinator uh, with the Cornell New York State Integrated Pest Management Program uh, housed uh, here in Geneva. She works uh, to promote the adoption of IPM practices by fruit growers to manage arthropod, plant disease, wheat, and vertebrate pests. She holds a PhD from Cornell University in plant pathology and plant molecular biology, a master's degree from the University of Massachusetts in plant pathology, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Maine in Boston. Her IPM research currently focuses on surveying orchards for invasive insects and alternative strategies for managing the destructive invasive insect, spotted wind drosophila. I also want to share that Dr. Carroll uh, was a recent recipient. Uh, she's an award-winning IPM faculty uh, who recently received uh, one of the most prestigious awards with the College of Agriculture, uh, the College of Agriculture uh, Research and Extension Award for Outstanding Accomplishments in Extension and Outreach. This award really recognizes Julie's demonstrated leadership in developing a highly innovative and responsive extension and outreach program that addresses fruit stakeholders' needs. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Carroll. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Alejandro. And I will get rolling forward i just want to on this slide acknowledge my uh technicians who worked with me on this project percy marshall and nicole mattoon and faculty member in horticulture courtney weber and in entomology greg Loeb. and now i will hope that the slide will advance when i press the right button and click on the screen that okay all right i'm not sure what i did but we're rolling along so a bit about spotted wing drosophila as we get started 
This insect was first found in New York in the fall of 2011, actually by somebody in our audience, Laura McDermott, who brought it to the attention <clears throat> of Greg Loeb and probably also Peter Yench, who was entomologist in the Hudson Valley at the time. This invasive species, Drosophila suzukii, is now well established across New York State. Currently, it arrives pretty early, earlier than it did when it was first found 10 years ago, as early as May. It has multiple generations per year and builds up to really high populations by September, October, November. It infests soft skinned fruit <clears throat> that ripens in late spring through fall. All of these fruits are at risk of infestation. SWD infestation destroys fresh fruit. And in addition, even fruit destined for a processing market may be rejected because there's typically zero tolerance for any white worms in processing fruit. Here you can see a picture of a male SWD on a blueberry fruit taken by Tim Martinson in September. So a little bit about its biology, <clears throat> because that can help us think about where its weaknesses are for management. The female, unfortunately, during her one month lifespan can lay on average 380 eggs into intact ripening delicious fruit. It only takes eight days from the egg to the adult in warm optimum conditions. So you can see how explosive this insect can be. In the lab, the optimum temperature found was 77 degrees Fahrenheit with a maximum of 91 and a minimum of 28. Those optima and max and min temperatures can vary depending on sunlight and relative humidity. SWD population growth is limited by high heat in the summer and by winter cold, so much so that in the Pacific Northwest, where it's pretty moderate all year long, this insect can be active and affecting those fruit crops almost all year long in those conditions. Whereas in Florida in the summer, it's so hot, the insect shuts down and even the winter fruit that are grown are not as severely affected as they are in the Northeast. We now know that SWD develops winter morphs that stop producing eggs in and around October, end of September, and they may have a reproductive diapause in spring, which slows the infestation of fruit in the spring in the Northeast. Recognizing SWD is really easy for the male flies. They have a characteristic dark spot on each wing. And under the microscope, you can see these two dark comb-like structures, two on each foreleg. And the type of comb that they are can help with speciation. When the male emerges from the pupa, it doesn't have the black spots, and it may take a few hours for those spots to melanize and darken. The females, on the other hand, have no dark spots on their wings, but they have this saw-like ovipositor you can see here in this magnified view of the ovipositor that enable the female to pierce the fruit skin and lay her eggs inside the fruit one to three eggs are laid per oviposition site most commonly only one and here you can see, I know that this is a female spotted wing Drosophila because I've been looking at these flies for so long. They're like good friends, but not really. I don't really like them at all. And this one had decided it was going to settle on my wine glass during the summer. 
So what fruit does SWD attack? Practically all soft skinned tender fruit is attacked by SWD if it's ripening during the time that the populations are building up. Raspberry is known to be the most susceptible crop to this insect. Blackberry a close second, followed by tart and sweet cherry and blueberry. Strawberries, plums, peaches, and grapes can also be infested. Although typically, even though it can oviposit in grape berries, the larvae don't develop very well inside the fruit. And so you don't get many adults emerging from that fruit. The insect has numerous wild hosts, and we know that these hosts are devastated in our natural ecosystems. For instance, in the Appalachians, there is a raspberry, I think it's black cap raspberry or a blackberry that is decimated. And this fruit is used by birds when they're fattening up for their migrations to the south. The impact of this insect is broad and wide. Crop loss is severe in seasons when ripening and harvests correspond with high SWD populations, as I mentioned. And you can see in this picture, the little white threads, as I've often been asked about, settling out and emerging from the infested raspberries in this market pack. This is what it was like for us during the year of the New York invasion, 2012. Most of us working with fruit crops and extension do not like to remember this year or even the ensuing year, 2013. SWD management in raspberry depends really on which type of raspberry you're growing. There are two types and they can somewhat overlap depending on the management tactics the grower is using. Floricane raspberries or summer raspberries, fruit on the canes that had overwintered. The canes produce the flowers in the spring and then the crop ripens earlier in the summer. For this type of raspberry, insecticides may not be required until the end of the harvest season. So monitoring the insect with traps makes a big difference in knowing whether the, in the insect has shown up and its population size. Alternatively, primocane or fall raspberries are mowed in the fall and the canes grow in the spring and fruit, flower and fruit much later in the summer. Insecticide protection is almost certainly required for primocane raspberries. Exclusion netting has been used and can be really effective, although it can be expensive as well. It will prevent the need for insecticides, provided the, the insect is actually excluded and there are no holes in the netting. Pruning and weed control to increase, to increase sun penetration, drying, lower relative humidity and heat have been shown to be detrimental to the insects. The female does not really like to oviposit where it's sunny and dry. Sanitation and destruction of dropped and overripe fruit can go a long way towards managing this insect, but it is labor intensive. After harvest, refrigerating the fruit at 32 to 33 degrees Fahrenheit goes a long way towards protecting the value of the harvest because it can kill and inactivate eggs and larvae that may be found in the fruit. Again, this insect is small. The first instar larvae are barely a millimeter long, and the third instar, the final instar, is really only about three millimeters long. So they're pretty small. And I'm sure many of us, or most of us, have been eating this insect for the last 10 years with absolutely no harm to us. Insecticides are applied weekly 
when at risk fruit are ripening and the insect is present. And rotating active ingredients of insecticides is crucially important. 10 years later, after the arrival of this insect, we are seeing in North America insecticide resistance rearing its head in some of our active ingredients. There's more information about spotted wing drosophila at fruit.cornell.edu slash spotted wing. So what are the impacts of SWD besides driving growers and extension workers crazy? Well, customer complaints, processor rejections. In blueberry, we know we can get 30% loss. And in late harvest varieties, many growers simply shut down as opposed to begin a spray program. 80% loss in raspberry has led to raspberry plantings being abandoned and no replanting occurring. I only this year heard of growers in New York beginning to plant new raspberry plantings, which is a testament for the advances the research community has done on managing this invasive insect in North America. Sanitation, as I mentioned, is labor intensive. The economic impact of this insect in the US is estimated at $1 billion, 7 million in New York State alone. Five to seven day insecticide spray schedules have disrupted established IPM programs in berry crops. And some berry growers in New York State didn't even spray before the advent of SWD. The picture that you can see is of infested tart cherries that were dumped on the ground in 2017 because they were rejected by the processor that year. 2017 was an outbreak year for SWD and no white worms are allowed in processing fruit. Why hummingbirds? Well, they eat drosophilids. 10 to 15% of their foraging time is spent seeking arthropods. Hummingbirds are curious. They learn to eat new foods and return to places where food resources abound. The ruby-throated hummingbird is a generalized feeder. Small-scale berry growers in New York State and in the Northeast need alternatives to pesticides for D. Suzukii management. So let's learn a little bit more about how and why hummingbirds eat arthropods. Scheidhauer in 1967 showed that arthropods form an essential part of their diet in aviary studies in Germany. He documented that a white-eared hummingbird caught and ate a mean number or an average number of 677 Drosophila melanogaster in a 16 hour day. Interestingly, he also found that the mere presence of a hovering white eared hummingbird in the aviary caused all the D. melanogaster, a species closely related to D. suzukii, to stop flying or moving. Hummingbirds may feed mainly or entirely on arthropods when floral resources are scarce. They actually evolved from insectivorous birds. Hummingbirds eat arthropods daily and at intervals as, frequently, as frequent as 10 minutes, and they feast on Hymenoptera, Diptera, Hemiptera, aphids, and Arachnida, spiders. The frequency of arthropod foraging increases during breeding, nesting, fledging, and before migration. Hummingbirds use the same vegetation strata for arthropod foraging as they do for nectar feeding. Hummingbirds fly fast, are highly maneuverable, and can chase a flying insect into their gaping beak and snap it shut in 0.006 milliseconds. Hey, that's 
six thousandths of a millisecond. Hummingbirds will test and learn to utilize new food sources, particularly when the new food source is in proximity to a known food source or within their feeding territory. Now more about ruby-throated hummingbirds in particular. They are the only hummingbird found in the Northeast. Archilochus colubris spends 85 to 90% of its foraging time feeding on nectar and about 10 to 15% of foraging time on arthropods. When nesting and feeding, they're young. The proportion of arthropods caught by the females increases. And once a rich feeding ground has been found, as I mentioned, and recognized, hummingbirds will return to it each spring to defend and stake the resources while aggressively defending the proximate breeding and mating and nesting locations. I was concerned about this, and so have other scientists been who've asked me about it. But when I ask my hummingbird enthusiasts if they find that hummingbirds prevent other hummingbirds from enjoying their feeders, they say, absolutely not. I've seen upwards of 10 hummingbirds at my feeder at one time. A female ruby-throated hummingbird will consume as many as 2,000 small insects a day when nesting and fledging young. This nesting and fledging timeframe coincides with when floricane raspberries are, protect, are producing fruit. During their southern migration, they double their body mass from three grams, about the weight of a dime, to six grams, about the weight of a nickel, to fuel their 18 to 22 hour nonstop migratory flight across the Gulf of Mexico, feeding heavily during their journey through North America. These birds nest as far north as Nova Scotia and therefore are going to be flying through New York on their way down to the staging areas along the Mississippi Delta and in Texas, etc. Now, this southern migration timing coincides with when primocane raspberries are bearing fruit, and which is also when young have fledged, so the population of hummingbirds is greater. Montgomery and Red Cell hypothesized that arthropods would be profitable in hummingbirds' diets when they were clumped and abundant, renewable, in predictable locations, nutritionally important, and when nectar is lacking. For the ruby-throated hummingbird, spotted wing drosophila in raspberry plantings would fulfill the first three criteria. So our objectives were to use hummingbird enrichment with hummingbird feeders to attract ruby-throated hummingbirds into the planting. Indeed, a Mississippi blackberry grower was already doing this and berry growers in New York State had asked me about it before we even embarked on this research. So we investigated whether the feeders, what the impact would be on hummingbird abundance and behavior, on spotted wing drosophila abundance, and on raspberry fruit infestation. We expected that the use of hummingbird feeders would result in greater presence of hummingbirds, lower trap catch of D. Suzukii, and lower fruit infestation in the locations of the field that had the feeders compared to those without. Here's the field plot designs. Diagrams A and B are the field plots in 2015 and 16 and 2017 and 18 respect, respectively. Fruits were sampled and traps were placed at eight locations along four transects in these fields shown by the open circles. Hummingbird feeders shown by the X's were placed in the treatment half of the fields at 62 feeders per hectare density, which is what the Mississippi grower was using. In 2020, we chose to compare two grower fields, one using feeders and one not. Fruits were sampled and traps were placed in a staggered, staggered pattern spaced 10, approximately 10 meters apart within the rows, also shown by the open circles. These plots were 2,500 or, or 0.025 hectares. 
and the farms were 160 kilometers apart. The feeders not shown were spaced by the grower using feeders at two per row in this raspberry planting. So the density was 151 feeders per hectare, and there were no, uh, no feeders in the other planting. Crop management in the research plots, they consisted of mixed genotype collections from Courtney Weber's breeding program. There was minimal weed, minimal weed control, no removal of cull fruit, so no sanitation, no harvests even, canes were not pruned or trained, no insecticides or fungicides were used, and the plots were surrounded by open fields with woodlands nearby but not adjacent. The grower plots, these were floricane raspberries, and the grower using feeders was a um, CSA farm, and it was the second year that he had been using feeders. These raspberries had drip irrigation, moderate to poor in-row weed control, mowed row middles, no fruit sanitation, but frequent harvests and no insecticides. The field was surrounded by open field on the east as shown in the photograph, row crops, in this case, asparagus on the south, peach orchard on the west, and a wooded yard and highway to the north. The farm without feeders was a U-pick farm. It also had drip irrigation, better weed control in the rows, mowed row middles, sanitation of cull fruit was practiced, and they initiated a conventional insecticide program when SWD was caught and fruit was ripe. They, um, I'll get to that a little bit later. I'll just hold off on that. This planting was surrounded by lawn on the east, a peach orchard to the south, a blueberry planting to the west, and woods on the north. The feeders were filled with cane sugar solution, one part cane sugar, four parts tap water, and the solution was refilled twice per week to make sure it did not run out. Two sets of feeders were used. We had one that was clean and ready and the other one that was in the field. And prior to reuse, we washed those, soaked them in a bleach solution and rinsed them thoroughly and allowed them to air dry to prevent the growth of mold and bacteria. The feeder protocol was provided to the grower and they manage their own feeders. Hummingbird observations were done late morning or late afternoon and consisted of two hour long observations. The first hour involved counting the number of hummingbirds sighted at feeders and during the second hour clocking the time the birds spent at the feeder and their flight patterns. So hitting the timer when the bird was seen flying into, towards the feeder, and then out of the field or away from the feeder. I noticed four flight patterns. One was the birds flew from the raspberries and then back to the raspberries when accessing the feeders. Another is they flew from the raspberries to the feeder and then out of the field. Another is they flew from outside the field to the feeder and then into the raspberries. And then the final flight pattern was they would fly from and to the feeder from outside of the field. The top three of these behaviors would show that they were occupying the raspberries and had predation opportunity to feed on SWD. Spotted wing Drosophila was assessed using Sentry jar traps and lures serviced weekly. Lures were replaced every four to six weeks. Insects were filtered from the drowning solution in the jars and the SWD enumerated under the microscope for each trap. Weekly fruit infestation was collected on a larvae per gram of fruit basis, assessed using salt flotation. 16 samples, eight per treatment, consisting of eight fruits were collected in the research plots 
And in the grower plot, 60 fruit were collected from each of the three rows. In the grower plots, we only assessed infestation two times at harvest. So the results for ruby-throated hummingbird observations showed that in both plots, the second year, 2016 and 2018, hummingbirds were more numerous. So they were more numerous in the second year. We also found that peak sightings or peak numbers seen at feeders occurred in August in all of the years. Hummingbird behavior that had predatory potential was excitingly upwards of 80% across all years. And observations of hummingbirds that were spending time in the raspberries, so flying from the raspberries to the feeder and then back into the raspberries, included 35% of the observations that were seen during those four years. In hummingbird uh, plots, in the grower plots, the observations were simply a 10-minute observation when the traps were being serviced. And this pattern was very similar. The highest number of hummingbirds were observed in August, as opposed to the rest of the year. And there were no hummingbirds seen in the farm that did not have hummingbird feeders. Results for trap counts showed that in the feeder treatment, there was lower average trap counts found in four of the six collection dates in 2016, seven of eight dates in 2017, and five of 11 dates in 2018. And six of these had significant reductions. The average trap count was reduced actually by 59% in the week ending on August 2nd in 2018. And this was at a time when 16 hummingbirds were being sighted per hour. The gray overlays on these charts show where the highest counts of ruby-throated hummingbirds were seen in each year. The cumulative trap counts plotted, so this is adding the trap count up over the season, show that the trend is for lower trap count in the feeder half of the field compared to the no feeder half of the field. And that trend was the same in all three years. In the grower plots, interestingly, the differences in trap counts were significant in eight out of 11 collection dates, such that the raspberry planting with hummingbird feeders had lower mean SWD trap counts than the farm without feeders. The, again, the gray overlay indicates the period when the hummingbird numbers seen per minute were really high. Harvests, thankfully, had ceased and UPIC was closed in early August. So around this time, about the time when the trap counts were becoming extremely high. So 12, over 12,000 SWD on average caught in the trap. Uh, in that raspberry field without feeders. Fruit infestation data is much more promising. In the research plots, we were not able to collect fruit in 2016 because of the drought. And these charts show for 2017 and 2018, for the dates with measurable larvae per gram in both treatments, the average fruit infestation was reduced by up to 64% in the feeder treated half of the field. Lower infestation was found in the feeder treatment on all but one date in both years, nine out of 10 collection dates in 2017 and seven out of eight collection dates in 2018. The lower fruit infestation coincided with or followed periods when hummingbird abundance was high, again shown with the gray overlay. Cumulative fruit infestation is even more striking when we look at the fruit infestation and we sum it over the year. 
It shows a steady trend in reduction of the larvae per gram of fruit in the feeder treatment compared to the no feeder treatment. In 2017, the hummingbird treatment reduced the number of larvae per gram by 6.76 over the course of the season, a negative 27.14% change. Fruit infestation in the grower plots. Again, we collected fruit on two dates. The first collection yielded no larvae from either grower plot. Yay! <laughs> so I'm always relieved when that happens. On the second collection date in late July, the farm with feeders had a mean of 0.015 larvae per gram. The mean in the feeder treatment in the no feeder farm was 0.037 larvae per gram. And there were seven larvae and 180 fruit in the feeder farm and 12 larvae and 180 fruits in the, in the no feeder farm. So not that big of a difference. Um, can't really tell much from these data. And this picture just shows a raspberry grower hosted hummingbird workshop that we held in Eastern New York. So in conclusion, for the hummingbird part of the study, the observed behaviors with predation potential were remarkably similar across the four years of the study. Feeders will attract ruby-throated hummingbirds to spend time in raspberry plantings. They were most abundant in August, and they were more numerous the second year. This indicates they would be present when SWD populations build to damaging levels and would become more numerous over years. And August coincides with the time in New York State when SWD populations typically build up. Hummingbirds as predators may have an ecology of fear effect on SWD, reducing feeding and egg laying, as found by Scheidhauer in 1967. And here in this adorable photograph, you can see a female ruby-throated hummingbird with chicks. And when she is feeding her chicks, as I have read in the literature, it is exclusively arthropods. No nectar is being carried in the crop to be feeding these birds. So it's pretty exciting. Conclusions on the spotted wing Drosophila side of things. Attracting ruby-throated hummingbirds into raspberry fields had a measurable negative effect on both SWD abundance and fruit infestation. In the research plots, the negative effect was larger and more consistent across the season on fruit infestation than it was on trap counts. In grower fields, the negative effect was evident more on trap counts, possibly due to the low fruit sampling we were able to do there. Cumulative trap counts and fruit infestation levels for all years showed a consistent trend in reduction of the SWD population and lower larvae per gram of fruit in the feeder treatment. What are some future directions? Well, you know, while ours may be the only study using a tactic to increase hummingbirds to enhance insect predation in fruit, we don't want it to be the last. More research is needed to define the costs and benefits of this approach, to determine the potential for scaling up this tactic, and exploring the use of hummingbird plants. We can then optimize our ability to factor this approach into IPM programs against SWD and fruit crops. We need to find out what the practical limitations on field size, labor, and cost are of using feeder enrichment. Can interplanting with nectar-rich plants be used instead of feeders to reduce labor and material costs without sacrificing yield? Can increasing plant biodiversity around and within our fields increase bird abundance and boost their foraging on the arthropod pests in our crops, and in turn, decrease our pesticide use? 
These are important questions going forward. And I wanna thank you all for your attention today. And I wanna acknowledge the technical support in my program from Elizabeth T, Ryan Parker, Taylor Herman, Tyler Seleni, and Jacob Robinson, and our grower collaborators, Chad Kirby and Rick Reisinger. Funding was obtained to support our study from the New York State Berry Growers Association and the USDA NEFA EIP program. If you have questions, hopefully you can ask them today, or if you have to leave and you want to email me later, my email is jec3 at cornell.edu. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Julie. That was what a, what a fantastic uh, topic and what a great uh, research you've been conducting the past few years. I'm going to uh, open the floor uh, for uh, questions and, and feel free to unmute yourself or uh, post any questions in the chat box. And I see we have one question coming in, Julie, uh, from Jody uh, Benedict. Uh, would hummingbirds have good places to nest nearby uh, also impact their uh, effectiveness? I don't know what their nesting preferences are. Their nesting preferences are to nest in trees on very slender, flexible branches. Um, if you Google images of hummingbird nests, you will see some actually on peach trees. And you'll see that I shared a photograph of a little hummingbird nest on a peach fruit. And it's not the only picture of a hummingbird nesting on a peach. I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, they will fly a considerable, a considerable distance to forage on nectar. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how far that is, so I apologize, Jody. Um, I don't want to give a number and be wrong. So they do, by and large, prefer to nest in trees, although there are pictures of them nesting on a number of uh, different you know, in a number of different places. Thank you, Julie. Uh, another question is, uh, what plants attract uh, hummingbirds? Okay, so the two most common plants that uh, grow wild in New York, one is um, an impatient species, which has orange and yellow flowers, and I'm blanking on it right now, it grows along uh in wet wet sites um touch me not may be a word it has seed pods that that explode you mean jewelweed? jewelweed jewelweed that may be it jewelweed has fleshy stems and you can use the stems against poison ivy okay you can crush the stems and use that uh against rashes on your skin so that is a very <clears throat> a uh, happy nectar feeding plant for hummingbirds. Monarda or bee balm is as well. They do tend to prefer red flowers um, as opposed to insect pollinated plants. The plants preferred by hummingbirds tend to have a tubular corolla. Trumpet vine is also preferred. Oh my, my parakeet had been quiet all this time. So I apologize, I forgot to cover her. Um, so you can find, if you Google, you'll find a number of different plants that are um, nectar producing plants that red through ruby, ruby throated hummingbird will feed on. But those are three of the ones that come to mind right off the right off the top of my head. Uh, another uh, question here, Julie, uh, uh, can you discuss uh, spraying uh, with uh, feeders in the field? Yes, I would be happy to discuss that with you. I reviewed all of the insecticides that are used for spotted wing Drosophila. None have an avian um warning on them and as you know there are some insecticides that may be problematic to
to avian species. Um, when I give a protocol on this technique to growers, I always tell them not to spray until they're taking the feeders out of the field to change the sugar solution. That is the perfect time if you're going to apply an insecticide spray or a fungicide spray, um, that would be the perfect time to do so. Now, that said, basically, the, I'll back up. Basically, what we don't want is we don't want to spray the feeders with a pesticide. We want to keep them clean, not only because you as workers will be handling that and handling that pesticide residue, and you don't want to do that. But the other, on the other side of the coin, we have to remember that we are applying, as a world, we are applying pesticides in fruit plantings and orchards all the time. And our bird species are exposed to those pesticides all the time if they enter our fruit crops and our environments where we are spraying. That is why it is so crucial for us to use IPM and to be good stewards of the pesticides that we have. Uh, the next one, Julie, uh, great work, uh, Julie. And uh, it's actually kind of similar to the previous one, more specific, I guess. Are there certain uh, pesticides affecting hummingbirds that we should avoid? And I would imagine some of those systemic products, perhaps, that move into nectar and pollen. But um, yes, I suppose that would be true. Um, although they are not known to be directly toxic to birds. Um, the other thing is that the neonicotinoid insecticides are not effective against SWD and they are not recommended for use against spotted wing drosophila. The insecticide that comes to mind that is not systemic is an organophosphate. Imidan is still registered in blueberry. Um, Malathion is also registered in fruit crops, certain fruit crops, that is an organophosphate. Those are neurotoxins. And so I would tend to avoid those types of things, those types of insecticides, that group. Um, pyrethroids are a broad spectrum insecticide, but they are going to be harsh against insects. Pyrethrum dust, is used on chickens against uh, mites. And so if it's used on chickens, I can well imagine that it's not going to be, the pyrethroids are not going to be an issue in our avian hummingbird friends. At the, you know, when applied correctly according to the label. Thanks, Julie. And uh, another person is uh, mentioning in the chat that I guess struggling with uh, balancing attracting hummingbirds with uh, excluding birds such as waxwings and catbirds that like to munch on the berries. I know. What a great question, Edwin. And thank you so much for asking it because we cannot neglect the fact that there are birds that um, cedar waxwing, for instance, is exclusively a fruit feeding bird. It feeds on nothing else but fruit. So I would say the tactics that you use against birds would need to not include bird netting. So, you know, I think bird netting would almost act like a mist net and the hummingbird might get stuck and caught in it. Uh, an organic blueberry grower that I've been working with on this technique has used hummingbird feeders. Uh, this was his fourth year. He uses um, owls, so he places owl effigies up and he uses bird scare tape, that metallic scare tape. So he said, Julie, what should I do? And I said, well, we're just 
just going to have to try it out. You just got to do it because you've got to protect your blueberries. So he put the tape out and the blue, the hummingbirds could have cared less. <laughs> I mean, they just, they went to the feeders. It was like, I don't care. So I think things like that, the balloon, uh, scare eye balloons, the tape, uh, any of those tactics, even potentially the cannon, you know, the auditory cannon, um, the screeching gun, I'm not so sure how they would respond to that, but I think you would have to figure it out. Obviously, those things happen instantaneously, um, and these are pretty courageous little birds, as you know, so I think they'll be fine. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat box, and anyone has, uh, I will invite any any other person who would like to ask a question to Julie, uh, unmute yourself. I do I do have a question, Julie. So you mentioned that in your research you were using sixty two feeders per per per. Is that per acre? Correct. It's per hectare. Per, per, acre, per hectare. It's uh, twenty four twenty five. Okay. So is that if you were going to make a recommendation, do you think that would be kind of the target number to attract a significant number of hummingbirds to the field? Yeah, I think that would be a minimum. Um, the blue, the blackberry grower in Mississippi had four acres of blackberries, and he has recently increased his acreage to, I think, eight acres of blackberry. These are you pick blackberry. And he was using 24, 25 feeders per acre. Um, so it must be cost effective and you know for for him to to do that. Chad Kirby was using two feeders per row. His raspberry planting is very small, right? It's tiny. He has four rows of raspberries. That's it. Um, and two feeders per row on his raspberry acreage translated to a little over two times. I think it was 64 feeders per acre. So now what I did was I changed my protocol and I said, you can use anywhere from 25 to, to 64. Frankly, I think you could use as many as you wanted to use within reason, right? So let's say you're a blueberry grower and you have early blueberry varieties and you have late blueberry varieties and they're not intermixed. What you could potentially do is focus the feeders on the late varieties as opposed to the early varieties, which may escape infestation. Just to, you know, you have to think, think about the life history and balance what what you're doing with the labor that you have and the money and the resources that you have. I kind of like farms that have drip irrigation because the hummingbird plants, jewelweed, monarda, that type of thing that you might think of interplanting. Let's say you've got a blueberry plant that died, so you've got a skip in your blueberry row. You would have that emitter on your drip irrigation that would help keep that perennial plant alive that Bonarda would grow there and thrive or whatever other plant you chose to, to put in there to encourage hummingbirds. So I think, you know, this is not a silver bullet. This is not a pesticide. This is changing the way we think about the agro ecosystem, increasing the diversity of, of, of what we're growing and going back to the point in time when the diversity of the agro ecosystem or the ecosystem in general, balanced pest outbreaks, um, as opposed to using insecticides and chemicals to keep those at bay. I think I went on a little bit long with your with the answer to your question. No, that's uh, uh, that. <laughs> and uh, so I think that uh, I'm just going to stop recording and I'm wanting by those interested to to have a more a close interaction with Dr. Julie Carroll to stay for another couple of minutes.